Hello folks, welcome back to Grace Church for another edition of Views of Grace. Uh, we are at the back of the church, uh, which does not have a fancy liturgical name other than the back of the church. Uh, you could say it's the front of the church if you come in the front doors, but if we think of the altar and chancel area as the front, then this becomes the back or the rear of the nave, as we talked about this area here being the nave. So today, we're going to be covering the areas from that corner to that corner across the back of the church. And you may be surprised to, at all the little things that are there that you might not have noticed before. But we're going to begin here in the center with uh, our baptismal font. The font is here near the front doors of the church, as a, a symbolically, as our entrance, our entrance into the church physically and our entrance into the church spiritually. And uh, it's, it's considered liturgically appropriate these days to have the font very close to the front doors of the church. This is, you may remember from our other views of grace, uh, we've had at least three fonts. This is at least the third font in the church. And this one came from Church of the Messiah in Olneyville. When Church of the Messiah merged with Grace Church in 2006, they brought this really beautiful marble font over. It was given uh, in uh, memory of Arthur Amory Gamble, and he died in 1887, so the font was given sometime after that. It's a really beautiful sort of pinkish coral colored marble with a, a large copper central basin, uh, some beautiful shell motif. David can probably zone in and show, show that beautiful shell motif down here at the bottom in high, high relief. It's, it's, it's large. Uh, you, could actually, you could actually almost put a, get a baby down in, in, into the font. Uh, one very interesting uh, piece of trivia about this font. It is the only baptismal font that I have ever known to actually be plumbed. And our former uh, building superintendent, Champ Cooley, at the direction of uh, Father Brooks, actually plumbed this. So there's a drain for the water in the base of the font, and it goes right down into a pipe in the floor. So the font isn't really movable, not only because it weighs hundreds and hundreds of pounds, but it, it's connected via plumbing through the floor of the church. Uh, but this is where we host our uh, bab baptisms here at Grace. The families and the celebrant come back to this part of the church and gather around the font. It's a wonderful symbol. Uh, one of our dear parishioners, Lois Lewis, who came from Church of the Messiah, tells me that her husband uh, had built a cover for the font. Many fonts have covers. But it sadly did not make the trip uh, from Messiah over here. So uh, my wheels are turning about how we might recreate something like that at some point for, for our font here. So that's here in the middle, but now we're going to move over to the side and we'll work our way back across. So the area here where I'm standing, the rear of the pews uh, and near the door, which goes up to the organ gallery, uh, really had been sort of vacant space. Uh, when I first came to Grace, and as many of you will remember, before our pavilion was built, the back of the church here, both this area and particularly the area on the other side, had to function uh, as meeting space, coffee hour space, storage space. Uh, one of the many happy things about our wonderful new pavilion is that these spaces were freed up and could be cleaned up a bit and, and turned into more worshipful purposes. Uh, we get lots of visitors here at Grace, obviously not these days, but we have and will again at our Open Doors ministry during the week. Many, many visitors come through the doors to see the church and are often looking for a place to light a candle. So a few years ago, we created this wonderful votive station. It's sort of put together from pieces and parts, a new-ish modern table, which is topped by a big, heavy piece of slate, which was the windowsill uh, of our sacristy before the renovation. We still had this big piece of slate, so we put that there to weight the table down and to be a safe space for candles. And you see lots of opportunities for people to light a candle in memory of someone or uh, to say a prayer for someone who is in need. And people do make use of that, both during the week when our guests come in and on Sunday our own parishioners uh, frequently light candles. There's a, a, a small prayer desk uh, if people want to kneel and say a prayer. And the space is backed by this uh, a, a print, certainly a print of a wonderful altarpiece. This is known as the Jan Florens altarpiece. Uh, which was painted in 1479, a three-panel a three piece. Uh, this was painted by Hans Memling, 
who lived in the 15th century. He was a German Renaissance painter. And uh, we, we found this actually on eBay and bought it to be the backdrop for this votive station. David's given you a good close-up. It has three uh, events in the life of Christ. Uh, the first, uh, of course, being the, the birth of Christ. Uh, there's Mary and Joseph in the stable there with some very small angels and Jesus. Mary in her traditional blue. The, the middle portion is the adoration of the Magi. My particular favorite, I love, I love this. And we did not have a representation of the Adoration of the Magi here at Grace anywhere. The Nativity is in a, a window, but this is not. And then even more specifically, on the right panel, we see the presentation of Christ in the temple, which we celebrate that liturgical feast on February 2nd. And we also did not have a representation of the presentation of Christ in the temple with Simeon and Anna, uh, the prophetess and prophet. And uh, so... This, I think, has been a fitting backdrop for this prayer station, and people have in, enjoyed this uh, wonderful thing. So you never know what you might find on eBay. So people are able to light candles. They can make a donation if they like. That helps us to buy candles. Uh, we also store our, our aisle pew candles to get used for Compline and Evensong and weddings and things like that. So these sort of form the sidewalls of, of this, uh, this intimate little space where people can, can say a prayer. David, let's just... Take a quick peek at this. Uh, this is borrowed from uh, Manchester Cathedral in England. They have a poet in residence, Andrew Rudd. This was done in uh, June of 2018. And it's thoughts on visiting a church. And I thought it was particularly appropriate because it talks about lighting a candle, listening to the organ. It refers to the, the glass garden. It calls the, the colors of the stained glass a glass garden. All things that felt very appropriate here at Grace Church. Um, and just, just a really lovely... Uh, set of thoughts about what people can think about if they need their thoughts directed a bit while they're here. So if you haven't visited this space, do that next time you're here. So also in this, and David's showing you the beautiful window above, which just, I'll just say quickly about that window. That's the latest of the 14 windows in the nave. That is the latest, uh, the last one, it was 1929. And it's just filled with wonderful colors, pinks and purples, colors you don't see in any of the other windows. Makes a really great backdrop here. So we, we have two large paintings in the church um, and one in each corner. So the painting here uh, that David can now show you is quite large. If I had to guess, I'd say it's about five by seven um, with a heavily ornate frame. This is a, a copy, but when I say copy, I mean a painted copy of Raphael's Transfiguration from 1520, that his original and uh, was from 1520, largely his most famous painting and in the 19th, 18th and 19th century, it was quite common for artists, either students of the masters or artists studying, to copy the works of the masters. And again, by copy, I mean to do their own painting of that painting. And some of the copies are quite good. Uh, this, is, this is a wonderful painting in of itself. It's just not the Raphael. Um, and there are a number of these copies around by different artists around the world, some in museums. Uh, this one was a gift to Grace Church in 1912 if you'll think back to our, our discussion of the Chapel of the Messiah with the beautiful carved Raridas with Christ in the center, I, I told you then that, that originally when the chapel was built in 1912, the Raridas was not there and the, the, the altarpiece was this painting. It was given to Grace in 1912 by a parishioner to be the altarpiece for, for the chapel. It must have been really imposing in that very small space because it's quite large. Um, would probably needs cleaning. Uh, be great to get it clean and would be marvelous to have some really good light on it. So maybe one of these days and you can really see it. We'll in our attachment that will be with this edition of, of Views of Grace, we'll, we'll give you a close-up of this and of the other painting when we get to the other corner. But again, this is a copy of the 1520 Raphael Transfiguration of Christ. So yeah, let's maybe look from about this direction. So as we go across, clearly what's, what's the centerpiece of the back of the church is the, the gallery and the organ case. So all of this woodwork that you see is black walnut, probably, probably can't even get it now. Um, and parts may be original, but mostly what you see is from 1886. So the church was built in 1846. There was a, a pipe organ uh, from the uh, Urban country, co Company in New York City, Henry Urban, much smaller than what you see now. And the gallery would have gone pretty much straight across, or, or nearly straight across. It might have come out this first bump, and then I think that's what it did. So across here, out there, and 
then the cross. When the 1886 came and it was determined they needed a new organ, so there's only barely 40 years after the original organ went in, they determined they need a new organ. They got this marvelous case and facade from the Hutchings Company in Boston, who's one of the leading organ builders of the day. Uh, and so this, the facade, all the pipes and the woodwork that you see up on the, around the pipes date from 1886. The stenciling on the pipes, everything. We're going to do a separate installation just on the organ, and we'll get some close-ups of the pipes and the stenciling when we do that. But when this organ went in in, 19, in 1886, they determined that the gallery was not large enough to accommodate it. So Richard Upjohn, who had built the, the church in 1846, they contacted the firm of Upjohn and his son, uh, came, Richard M. Upjohn, came and he supervised the design and building, building out of the gallery. And many people have asked, why are those pews inside the gallery? Can we come over, David, and take a peek at this? So there's a pew here. David, get me looking like I'm in jail. Right. These are the people that didn't pay their pledge, they had to sit here. So what we've discovered, though, is that the pews were already here, and the gallery was brought out over the pews. And so that's why the pews are encased, because it was, they were brought out. The pews came all the way to the back. And you can even see here, this would have been the top piece of another pew here. So they would have gone, gone across. David's getting some pictures of some of the, some views of some of the memorials along the way here. Really, really wonderful woodwork. Pretty much in what would be called the early English style. Clearly Gothic. But if you stand, and maybe if, uh, if David can get a view from where he is, if you look through the woodwork, you can see that the organ case is lighter and more reddish in color, more golden reddish in color, and this is much darker than this was what would have been added at the same time, but they tried to match, this was being matching the previous woodwork and the organ was sort of its own. So as we come across, again, for many of us who've been around Grace for a few years, you would remember much of the time that this was Coffee Hour Central. And there were, there were uh, tables and coffee pots and garbage cans, and, and it, was a, it was a wonderfully hospitable thing to pr provide and to do. Uh, but boy, was I happy the day we could take, clean those things out and, and uh, tidy up a bit. Probably the pews would have continued on this side the way they did on the other side. At some point in our history, don't know when, maybe the 50s, the floor looks like the 1950s, those pews were removed for, for some purpose. Uh, and now we have this uh, wonderful sort of library table where our docents can sit uh, if, during the week when they're here and we have a little bit of storage. You may remember uh, at the front of the church we had two large memorial plaques, brass, um, bronze and marble. This is bronze. This is the World War II uh, memorial plaque. 41 to 45, all those who, uh, in honor of those who, uh, memory of those who died, in honor of those who served. And in the center is the seal of Grace Church, beautifully rendered actually there in the bronze. Nicely framed by the fire, fire alarm signal. And then above, let's just go on up, David. We have one of our other paintings here. So this is by the Spanish, uh, well, it's a, again, a copy, a painted copy of, of a work by the Spanish artist Murillo. This dates from 1670, the, the original dates from 1670. This one was purchased in 1875 in Europe and given to Grace in 1926. Uh, so again, purchased in the 19th century, probably painted in the 19th century, purchased then and by a family, an American family, and then given to Grace in 1926. So the interesting thing, I will also attach a, a, a close-up of this, but the interesting thing about this is the Murillo painting of the Madonna and Child was much, much copied. But the copies didn't all look exactly like the original. They just looked sort of like the original. 
And our copy is a copy of a copy. So if you look at the original Murillo, Madonna and Child, it doesn't look quite like this. But there are some very famous ones that look like this that were copies of his original. It's really sort of mind-boggling how it works. All in all, it's still a beautiful painting. The, the key to this painting, and I'm no painting expert, Andrew Raftery can, can uh, give us the, the real facts, but the key to Murillo's uh, Madonna and Child is that there was no divinity associated. Little bit of lighting around the head, but basically just looking like a mother and child. So if you haven't seen that, definitely come and take a look up close, but it's so high up it's hard to do that, so you can look at the, the photo that we attach. And then lastly, we'll just focus on sort of this, this corner. Again, this was an area we didn't really have before because we had, we had so much sort of paraphernalia, paraphernalia around coffee hour back here. Um, and the pews, probably these pews did stop here. The middle pews came back uh, farther. These probably stopped here. But the beautiful 1846 uh, walnut paneling continued around. And so once we had sort of cleaned the space up and moved into the pavilion, we decided to use this as another opportunity for individual prayer. So there's some things, the lovely window backdrop, of course, that gives you, that sort of functions as, a, as an altarpiece, as it were, to this, to this area. Some great colors, rich colors. But if we get close, there's some things to take a peek at. The, the prayer desk particularly, this was designed by the firm of uh, Ralph Adams Cram, Cram Goodhue and Ferguson. And was in, brought into the church basically when the, I believe it says 1912, yes, 1912, when the chancel was designed. And if you see David Kinzonian, probably these uh, sort of bosses uh, are very much like what's on the choir stall. In fact, almost identical to what's on the choir stall. These weren't gilded. These were lift wood. Um, the printing, the, uh, the type, the font is the same as what's used there in the, up in the chancel. This would have been a prominent feature, probably in the central aisle, right at the foot of the chancel steps. That was very common in those days to have a, have a prayer desk there. So uh, it has been rescued from the basement. It was, it was languishing in the basement, and we've cleaned it up and brought it up um, and added a, a modern icon, Christ Pantocrator. This is a Greek icon, hand-painted. Uh, and again with a candle and, and a, a lovely place that someone can kneel and say a prayer. Just to the left, and I'm particularly interested in this because probably since it's wood, like the, the rest of the wood, I suspect many have never seen it. This is also the seal of Grace Church. The chalice, star, the cross, and three shells and an anchor. And the last thing I want to point out uh, back here today, I'm not sure how many people have ever noticed this. We, we have a, a, a plaque with uh, wardens and rectors, uh, with more wardens and rectors of Grace Church. But that's, that's lovely. It's not what I'll point out. If you've not noticed, there's a, a bit of information here and, and what looks like some, if, if you can tell close, I'll get out of the way and let David get really close. This, is, this is, was discovered paint treatment when layers of paint were being removed in the sort of what, mm, the 20th century, mid to late 20th century, this highly decorative floral painting with vines, leaves. I'll let you get in there, David. See if it, it's, it's hard to see, actually. So what we now know is that that was not the original painting in 1846. The original interior would have been basically a reddish, muddy brown, sort of like the brownstone outside. But in the 19th century, we know uh, later in the... Uh, 19th century, numerous decoration campaigns went on, and, and at one point in the sort of, let's see, 1846, probably the 1880s, highly decorative painting was added all over the church. We have some photographs that show, but this would have been what you would have seen here. Uh, some deep, rich colors, vines, leaves, grapes. Uh, so the church would have had a very, very different feel than it does today. So we have a bit of history there from under the wall. So do come and take a look. And again, there's, there's a, a bit of history and information in the document next to this painting. And there's also inside the window here, there's just a bit more. You have to almost see this in person, but, but do come and take a peek.
Maybe it's getting pretty close there. And the last thing I'll show us today, we have, this is the Grace Church banner, which basically lives back here in the corner. Uh, it's a lovely piece of work, but the, the real significance of it is that the central panel of the banner is the central panel of our east window in the chancel. Uh, and because the window is so big and so high, it's difficult to see. This gives you a close-up. Uh, Christ seated in majesty, Christ holding the orb, uh, and uh, surrounded by angels. Here, some cherub, small cherub heads, some flying angels. And I've told you that, you know, we've talked about the fact that thuribles keep reappearing at Grace, even though historically that's not been part of Grace's history. But here at the feet of Christ in majesty, two very serious angels swinging uh, golden or brass thuribles. So this is a great way to take a peek at the, a close-up of our east window, if you, because it's so hard to see it because it's so high up. So just as a, a quick recap, we've done the high altar and uh, rare doss and window. We've done the chancel, wood, and furnishings. We've done the chapel of the Messiah. We've done the crossing of the church. And now we've done the rear portion of the church across the back where there was probably way more to see than you realized. Um, so we have several things planned coming up. We're going to be looking at the windows. We're going to do an addition on the back organ itself and on the front organ, getting you some views inside. Um, We'll be doing a look at the sacristy and some of the things, some of the wonderful things in the sacristy that you may not see every week. Uh, so happy to hear from you. If there are places or things you'd like to see or hear about, let us know. And I hope that you're all staying well and healthy and looking forward again to brighter days, hopefully really soon, and uh, have enjoyed this edition of Views of Grace. Until next week.